Bruchem Aboyim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. And um, this week, we are, the topic of my thoughts is the book with only two verses in the Torah. So, this week my thought examines two unique verses in the Torah. Uh, many people, including Christians and Muslims, know that there are five books of the Torah, or otherwise known to them as the Old Testament and the Torah. Uh, many people, including Jews, would be surprised to hear that our sages refer to the seven books of the Torah. They are the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Now, the fourth book of Numbers, uh, Numbers, according to some of our sages, is divided into three separate books. The first book starts at the beginning of chapter 1, verse 1, and then ends at chapter 10, verse 34. The third book begins with chapter 11, verse 1, and continues to the end of the book. However, the second book, consists of only two verses, chapter 10, verses 35 and 36 exclusively. Now these two verses are separated from the rest of the book of Numbers with two inverted nuns, which are written in a Sefer Torah. Now the first nun is placed at the beginning of verse number 35, and the second one at the end of verse 36. This is the only place in Torah where these letters are used to mark a separation. These two verses are recited whenever we as Jews remove or return the Torah to the Ark. This ritual is followed during any prayer service where we read from the Torah. Verse 35 states, Vayihibin Soharon, and it was when the Ark went forth that Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and scatter your enemies. Let your foes flee before you, uh, which is recited as we open the Ark even before we take out the Torah scroll. The second verse, verse 36, Uvenucha Yomar, and when it was rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's thousands, which is recited as we return the Torah scroll back to the ark. It is an unusual fact that in all temples and synagogues, Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox, somehow, Whenever they read from the Torah, they all recite these words in their prayer services. As we know, nothing is an accident. So what is the Torah telling us about this division? Now the Torah mentions in the portion of Aloscha, uh, chapter 10, verse 35, the words, Vayihi ben Soharon, and it came to pass when the ark went forth. And Rashi, our primary and illustrious 10th century commentator, tells us that God made for its signs and inverted nuns before and after to inform us that this is not in its proper place. Why then was it written here? So Rashi answers, in order to make an interruption between one disturbing incident that occurred and another. So these two verses are out of place. They should have been placed 50 verses earlier in the book of Midbar, in chapter 2, verse 17. There the Torah describes the placement of each of the tribes as they traveled through the desert. It tells us that the tent of the meeting, the Mishkan, and the camp of the Levites shall travel in the middle of the camps. Now, at this point in the narrative, the Torah should have recorded these two verses which describe what Moshe said when the ark traveled. Instead, the Torah chose to put these two verses here as an interruption between the two punishments that the Jewish nation received at that time. Now the first of the two punishments was when the lowest of the people began to complain about the mun. Now the mun was the heavenly food that fell daily from heaven. They demanded that Moshe give them meat. In response, God then sent them the quail as a punishment. Many of the people ate the quail and many of the people died. The second punishment occurred when the people complained about the rigors of their travels. God then sent a heavenly fire that consumed many of them. God did not want the Torah to mention consecutively two sins that the nation had transgressed and were punished for. He therefore inserted these two verses to separate the two incidents. Our sages tell us that once Mashiach comes, God will no longer punish the Jewish nation and these verses will be returned to their proper place in the portion of Amidbar. Now, according to another opinion, these verses contain 85 letters. So we learn from this that 85 is the minimal number of letters that can be considered a book by itself. 
There is a law that if a Torah scroll is missing too many letters, it may not be fixed. And it must be buried. So since 85 letters may be designated as a book, that becomes the maximum number of letters that may be missing without making the Torah scroll beyond repair. However, that is only for a, what we call a small scroll, one containing only one book of the Torah out of the five. But a complete Torah scroll, one that contains all five books of the Torah, that is missing more than 85 letters, may be fixed. So the number 85, though, it's not a random number. The number 85 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word pet, meaning mouth. Our sages tell us that Torah should not be studied only with one's eyes. Rather, one should articulate the words so as to be able to better understand and retain the subject matter. The same can be said about prayer. In order for one's prayers to be accepted by heaven, they must be articulated. If one reads only with their eyes, they have not prayed. There are additional reasons given for the inverted nuns. The letter nun, if you spell it out, is nun vav nun. The two nuns allude to the two words that the nation recited as they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai when they accepted the Torah. Nasa v'nishma. We will do and we will listen. The fact that the nuns are inverted is an indication that now, after the sin of the golden calf, their condition was reversed. These two nuns also signify that this is the reverse, the opposite of what God wants for us, based on the Taliyoros. Nakshoni states that the two nuns symbolize the destruction of both of our temples. The Hebrew word, Kuma Hashem, Arise, O Lord, is a prayer for the coming of Mashiach and the rebuilding of the third temple. May it happen quickly and in our time. Nun in Aramaic means fish. Survival of a fish in water is many times dependent on its ability to swim against the current. So too with a Jew living in a secular world. In order for us to survive spiritually in this modern world, we must be able to go against the tide of secular values that dominate our society. You know, Sephardic Jews have a custom of eating salmon at their Shabbos meals, since there is no fish that swims against the current more than salmon. The gematria, the numerical value of the letter Nun, is 50. This may be an allusion to the fact that the children of Israel received the Torah on Mount Sinai 50 days after they left Egypt based on a divine design. Now, in Psalm 145, the Ashrei prayer that we recite three times daily, Davon Amalek, King David, began each verse with a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. All the verses are in alphabetical order from Aleph to Tuf, from A to Z, so to speak. The exception to this fact is the letter Nun. There is no verse that begins with this letter. The reason given for this omission is that the letter Nun is connected with to the Hebrew word nephilah, falling. It alludes to evil tidings for the Jewish nation. But in the Torah, the inverted nuns are compared to a deer. Just like a deer, when it runs away from that danger, is constantly looking backwards, so too God Almighty, even in times of distress, when he is, so to speak, running away from us, still, he continues to look backwards, so as to afford us with some protection, based in the Pharisees. As I mentioned before, the reason why Dovin and Melech did not put a verse in Psalm 145 for the letter Nun is because the Nun alludes to Nephilim, falling. However, the letter that follows the Nun in the Hebrew alphabet is a Samach, which stands for Samech, support. So the verse reads, Samech Hashem l'chol anoflim, that God lifts up supports all of those that have fallen. The nation of Israel were redeemed from their oppressive slavery in Egypt in the month of Nisan. The word Nisan is spelled with two nuns. One is at the beginning of the word and the other at the end. Between these two nuns is a Samach. Now the first nun alludes to the fact that the children of Israel suffered in Egypt before they were redeemed. The Samach in the middle alludes to their redemption. But then they suffered again, and this is alluded to by the second nun when they sinned and were sent into exile, again, based on Italioros. Our sages explain that the letter Nun denotes misfortune, misery, 
again, since it is connected to the concept of nefila, of falling. The way to turn such misfortune and disaster into happiness and good tidings is by turning the letter nun upside down. Thus, when the Torah recounts two calamitous episodes in the history of the Jewish nation, we find that they are separated with the introduction of the holy ark bordered by the two backwards nuns. This was to indicate that through the power of Torah which was placed in the ark, we have the ability to turn our calamities into good fortune based on a Torah tablet. The Hebrew word nase, which means miracle, begins with the nun, the fila, falling, but, but it ends with the samach, support or help. So this is an allusion to the concept of what we call yurida la aliyah, a descent for the purpose of an ascent. That many times, the way for someone to be elevated is by first bending down as low as they can so that they can jump much higher. As we recite three times daily in the second blessing in the Amida, the standing prayer, Somech Noflim, he lifts up those who have fallen. The Talmud in the tractate of Shabbat 31a states that the letter Nun stands for Nimonos, faithfulness and consistency. Since the children of Israel had sinned three times in this portion, they displayed a, a lack of faith in God. So the Torah places these two verses right in between as a divider of sorts, so that these three episodes should not constitute a precedence, what we refer to as a chazaka, of negative behavior that would become habitual, again based on Torah Tavlin. Verse 35 alludes to the history of the Jewish nation. It alludes to the times that the nation living in exile will be persecuted by their enemies. Moshe prays that God will protect the children of Israel and defeat all of their enemies. Verse 36 alludes to the times that the nation will live in peace and prosperity in their exile. All of their blessings and successes will cause them huh, to forget their God and disregard his Torah and mitzvot. Then, as the verse says, Shuvah Hashem, return, O Lord. Then Moshe prays that God will help us to become Baale Tshuva, repentance, to recognize the error of our ways and return to the godly path in our lives. Verse 35 contains 12 words, which correspond to the last verse in the Torah, which also has 12 words. Verse 36 contains 7 words, which corresponds to the first verse in the Torah, which again is made up of 7 words. Now, according to Kabbalah, there are 7 alephs, in the verse, thir, in verse 36. Now the word for 1,000 in Hebrew is Aleph, which alludes to the 7,000 years that the world will exist, according to Rabbeinu B'chai. If one takes the last letter of the three Hebrew words, by Yechib ben Soha Aron, they spell out the Hebrew word Oni, a poor man. This alludes to the fact that the poor also have to wander from place to place to survive. Based on this fact, we should show them both honor and respect, just as we show to the ark that housed the Ten Commandments based on Divri Avram. Verse 33 states that when the nation would travel in the desert, the ark would precede them by three days and would seek out a place for them to rest. When they were ready to travel, Moshe would address the ark with the words in verse number 35, Kuma Hashem, rise up, O Lord. Rashi states that since the ark went before them a distance of three days, Moshe would say, halt and wait for us and do not go any further. So the function of the ark was to travel before them and kill out all the snakes and scorpions in addition to seeking out a place for them to camp. These statements seem to really contradict each other. Was the ark in the camp or did it travel three days ahead of the people? Which one? What most people don't realize is that there were really two arks. One was housed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. It contained the second set of tablets that Moshe brought down from the mountain the third time that he was there. The second ark that was made by Moshe, which contained the first set of tablets. We know that Moshe broke these tablets when he came down from the mountain the first time. Not only did these broken tablets prepare the road and campsite for the nation, they would also accompany them whenever they went out to battle. We learn a great lesson from these broken tablets. 
the fact that they were broken, did not diminish in any way from their sanctity and holiness. In fact, our sages tell us that the broken tablets were stored together with the second set of tablets in the ark and resided that resided in the Holy of Holies. This teaches us an important lesson in life that though a Torah scholar may become infirmed or develop dementia, nonetheless, they should be treated with the same respect and honor that they received when they were healthy and mentally sound. Now, since nothing is an accident, I find it interesting that these two verses in chapter 10, verses 35 and 36, when added together, 35 and 36 equal the number 71. 71 is not a random number in Judaism. Yaakov Avino, Jacob our father, went down to Egypt with 70 souls, and the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, went with them, 71. So our rabbis tell us that it was after the Tower of Bubble, when God dispersed all the people. He divided them into 70 root nations, and then he designated the children of Israel to be the 71st nation. We have a belief, according to Kabbalah, that all Jewish souls are connected to these 70 souls that went down with Jacob, our father, Yaakov Avinu, to Egypt. Now, the 70 root nations of the world are then connected to these 70 Jewish souls. Whatever affects these 70 souls affects the nation that it represents. Our sages tell us that during the holiday of Sukkot, the Kohanim would offer 70 oxen as sacrifices in the temple. These 70 oxen were brought as protection for the 70 root nations in the world. The 71st ox was brought as an offering on the eighth day of the holiday, called Shemini Atzeris, for the children of Israel alone. In fact, the Talmud states that if the nations of the world would have understood the benefit that they received from these sacrifices, they would have placed guards around the temple and would never have allowed it to be destroyed. Moshe was commanded by God to appoint 70 elders to assist him in leading the people. He then would have been the 71st. Following that example, the Jewish High Supreme Court, known as the Sanhedrin, was made up of 71 judges. Now, the number 10 also has great relevance in Judaism. God created this world with 10 sayings. He took upon himself 10 traits. Three of them are intellectual and seven emotional traits. He also gave us the 10 commandments on Mount Sinai. If we were to add the number 10 with the number 71, it would equal 81. As I've mentioned before, many times in my lectures, the number nine is, alludes to truth. Eighty-one is nine times nine, an allusion to God Almighty, who is the ultimate truth. Eighty-one is the gematria, the Hebrew numbers of the word, Hebrew word anochi, I am, which alludes to God Almighty, who is the one and only ruler in the universe, the only one that can say anochi, I. There is much more that could be said in reference to these two verses, or as some refer to it, the book. But hopefully we have gained some appreciation of just how much information and knowledge the Torah can inject into just two verses. You know, the Hebrew word, Yobo Elio, and Elijah will come, have a gematria of 71. Our rabbis tell us that Elijah, Elio and Nabi, will be the one to announce the coming of the Messiah. And so let us hope that he will do so quickly and speedily in our time. Again, I'd like to thank you very much for attending. I hope you found the lecture interesting. Uh, God should bless you with health and happiness and safety. And uh, again, let me wish you again a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.